Welcome everybody. This is Internet Marketing Unleashed. I'm Scott Patton, the Dean of Blogonomics and Podology. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very, very excited to bring uh, this guest on. He is absolutely amazing. He's the author of two books, Becoming the New Boss, and, which is available on Amazon, and an ebook that just came out that has to do with understaffing. It is called The Epic Solutions understaffing. He is an accomplished executive coach and organizational consultant and he's a much sought after trainer and lecturer. He completed his doctorate in human and organizational psychology which analyzes successful individual and organizational psychology, uh, sorry, change and development and he holds two master's degree in education and educational leadership. He's a practical action-oriented uh, consultant and this has endeared him to his many clients. His personal experience in the leadership field allows him to understand leaders needs and craft solutions to help them optimize their performance and success. So welcome to the show Naftali Hoff. How are you doing today? I'm doing great Scott. Thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure. And I'm really excited to talk with you today because this is kind of uh, brings me back to my roots. I grew up working for a grocery company that, that uh, spanned half of Canada and most of the Western United States, and I managed grocery stores for, for most of that time. And I would have between 35 to 300 employees at any one time. And we had two, and this was basically from the late 70s to the mid 90s. And we had a number of issues during that period. One was, there were no uh, female managers. So we were going through that transition of how do you bring the, the women were the cashiers or they were the deli clerks. So how did you bring them into assistant manager positions and from there into store manager and above? And it was a difficult transition uh, at that time because there was no training about it. There was no discussion about it. We just had this person we didn't know how to relate to. You know, I'd be in my early to mid 20s or most and my bosses were like 30s and 40s and we had no clue what to do and uh, so there was kind of that transition there was also then transition from most of the people grew up in the organization they started as a clerk then they kind of moved up to assistant manager manager everything else and so they might have finished high school, right? They, you know, they and they grew up in a very autocratic, authoritarian uh, environment because that's the way the grocery industry was at in the fifties and sixties, and um, so there was that change to we need people who are have a higher level of education, have a better way of dealing with other people. We didn't know how to do that, um, and then of course. We had a huge issue with understaffing. So kind of both of your books have really kind of touched me in terms of, uh, you know, my growing up period. And I think probably it hasn't changed since then either, except that I'm no longer managing 300 people. Uh, but we would go into, you know, you'd go into stores and there'd be lineups. So we're understaffed, right? So then what do you do? Or how do you get the staffing right and uh, you know everyone had different ideas and then of course how you hired and that just goes on and on and on so uh, so I'm really excited to be able to pick your brain and talk to you and kind of and then this is kind of the background that I'm going to be coming from and some of my questions or some of my 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 situations but tell us a little bit about how you got into education and and specifically leadership so education almost happened by accident. Um, I actually had aspirations to be a lawyer once upon a time. Wow! Uh, I was I was reared in the LA law days. I don't know if that if that uh, um, TV show uh, resonates with you, but that was all the rage back in the eighties. And um, I went off to Israel. I was studying in a yeshiva program in Jerusalem. I got bitten a little bit by the bug of advanced uh, studies and really liked the idea of engaging with others. I fell into a couple of part-time opportunities and I just loved it. And so I pursued it more robustly, eventually completing, like you mentioned, a couple of master's degrees, but more importantly, a number of years in the field. So I was teaching pretty consistently over a, uh, I would say, a 12-year period. During that time, I began part-time roles in school administration, school leadership. 
eventually became a head of school of an independent school down in Atlanta and uh, really loved that entire experience for a variety of reasons. And at the same time, wanted to focus specifically on leadership. And so I pivoted about five years ago into executive and leadership coaching, though I still do quite a bit of my work in the educational space, supporting schools and school leaders. Uh, I've now had the privilege of really branching out and sharing my ideas and my expertise with people of all stripes. Um, and, and it's interesting, Scott, because you talked about your background, your history, and the challenges of the workplace in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I would argue that many of those are still very relevant today. You know, you mm -hmm. may still, you may not have the demographic challenges in terms of having big, let's call it demographic voids in management. You mentioned an absence of female uh, leaders in that grocery um, network that you were involved with that chain. But I'm still finding today that people are still struggling with the basics of how do I communicate? How do I delegate effectively? How do I manage resources properly? How do I analyze the skills that I need and the skills that I have and putting them together and identifying where my gaps are and filling those gaps? All of these things, which may seem basic to any industry, any environment, the kinds of things you would expect people to grapple with on a regular basis, they're just not getting enough training and experience, whether it's from their university um, education or their opportunities, at least early on in the workplace. And so what's happening is people are moving up the, the, the chain of command. They're, they're getting promoted. They're moving what, from what we might call the technician to the manager or ideally even to the leader. Uh, but they're doing so with a mindset of being still very much enmeshed and, 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 and surrounded by the work that needs to get done in the moment and not having the capacity to step back and think about how do I lay the foundation, how do I establish relationships, how do I get the right people in the right places, instead of focusing on what I need to do at the moment to get the job done, how do I position my people better so that they could be the ones grappling with the day-to-day -day, and I could be leading things, whether it's in front or behind, different leadership styles that we could get into. But nonetheless, I'm seeing that regardless of all of the progress that we've made, and we've made a lot, there's still a lot of room for growth right. for many, many people. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in what you're talking about in terms of unwillingness to become comfortable in their organization's culture. And, and, of course, internal politics, too, because I know there's lots of people that are, oh, I don't want to be involved in the politics and everything else, which I think comes from uh, a lack of understanding what politics is in terms of an organization, which is basically, in my opinion, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's more how to get my ideas across and integrated into the culture of the organization so that's the direction people go. Yeah, well, a lot of that is set by the leadership. I'm reading a book now called Multipliers, where the authors focus on different types of leaders and the kind of environment that they create within their organizations. And so if you have leaders that set the, um, the expectation that their people will have a voice and give them a platform to solve problems and to discuss ideas, it's a lot easier for people to go ahead and express those. Where they feel that their ideals will not get any traction and that their concepts will perhaps even be discouraged or, or, or not appreciated, most folks are going to step away from that, even if they feel that they have something to share. So I think a lot of it, like I said, really relates to what kind of environment we as leaders are creating for the people around us. And then as it relates to individuals who are trying to express ideas, maybe they haven't been invited specifically, but they still want to find an opportunity. Um, they may need to be a little bit more careful about the approaches that they use, that people will actually be receptive to their ideas. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of it is just uh, positioning yourself effectively because we all know that relationships are the foundation of everything moving forward. You know, John Maxwell talks about this when he talks about leaders, where you could have a leader who people don't support the leader, they don't support his or her agenda. Obviously, you need to get a new leader. If you have a leader that people support as a person and as in terms of the ideas that they're advancing, you get behind the leader and you support that person and you see that idea through. But where you have leaders that are sort of in between, you know, they, they are uh, their ideas are liked. They have good concepts. They know their 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 environment, their their industry, etc. But as leaders, they're not connecting with their people well. 
then in most cases, the, the research says that people have to get a new leader as opposed to get behind the leader because I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. You know, these types of ideas. It's really about the connection first, establishing that relationship as the foundation, and then advancing ideas and strategies around it. And that's what I focus on in both of the books, but particularly in the Becoming the New Boss book. And, you know, that applies whether you're leading, in, like in my case, I'm leading a store with 30 employees or I'm leading a store with 300, or in my situation now where I have a couple clients, because as you were talking, I was thinking, yeah, like I have two clients. One is, and they're both um, very competent, like really good at what they do, right? And, they're, I mean, and their vision's excellent and everything else. But one's like grating on my personality, and the other one is just like wonderful, right? You know, and I've been struggling for 15 years with the one that's grating on the personality because I really like his vision, I really like where he's going, and everything else. But man, oh man, when I got the second one, the difference between the two was it was just so obvious that one is demotivating me and one is motivating me. Because I look at what I'm doing for one, I look what I'm doing for the other, and I'm just shaking my head, right? It's just like, you know, why am I not, you know, putting out for the other guy the way I'm putting out for this? Well, one is saying, you know, wow, oh, that was a great idea. Way to go. Oh, man, that's awesome. And the other is, you know, we only had 2,000 people listen to the podcast. That's really awful. Uh -huh. You know, in this particular yeah, in the particular case, I'm right? with you 100. percent And I feel that that's that's a fascinating um, dynamic that you're describing here. Excuse me for one second. So the idea is that if you, I'm working actually with somebody now as a, as a coaching client, and my first conversation with that person, I like to go deep. My first conversations, I really want to get to know somebody and see if I can provide you know real value for them, etc. And I must tell you, it was quite the uphill battle. Um, it was very tiring for me, very draining, because this person had some real negative self-talk. Yeah. Uh, this is somebody who's trying to reposition himself in the market, find new employment opportunities, and every suggestion was, I've tried that a thousand times, it's not going to work. Um, it was, I can't do this, this is not going to you know, happen. And I said to myself, you know, I even asked the person, tell me what would it look like if you could double your income? Right? How would your life change? What would your experiences be like? I wanted to sort of paint a picture with that individual about this new life, get him excited about it so that we could actually work towards achieving that. And he just like he couldn't allow himself the ability to go there uh, yeah. in the way that he really needed to. So I think that part of it is important for me. And so I had a conversation with him and I said, I'm not sure that I could be your coach if you can't allow me to go deep with you in certain ways and not feel this fundamental resistance um, that you're experiencing right now. And I think that sometimes it's the responsibility. I'm not telling you what to do, Scott, but I often find that it's our responsibility, whether it's a leader, a team member within an organization that needs to ultimately lead up, you know, whether it's the coach to the client, whether it's the, the, the coach or consultant to the client, whether it's the member of the team to the team leader, Sometimes we need to be able to say, I want to support you, I want to serve you, I want to do the very best job I can do, but I need you to provide me with the platform and the mindset that's going to allow that to happen and happen properly. And that can't happen but with me sort of hitting the wall time and again. Uh, it's not an easy conversation by any means. I'm not suggesting no. that it's the kind of thing you want to just run in and have that conversation. But if you don't have the conversation, then I find that you're not optimized, the people that are hiring you or engaging with you are not getting the most, and it, it can be avoided at times. So it's something for us to think about. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Uh, I want to shift a little bit to the um, understaffing uh, ebook that you've got. Uh-huh. Uh, because as I was just interested, I, like I haven't heard anyone talk about understaffing for a long time. I'm totally understaffed because I'm a solo entrepreneur. And uh, wh what was interesting was I ran a store on the west coast of Canada, about 500 miles north of Vancouver, basically at the end of the world. There was 13,000 people in the town. I wouldn't uh -huh. even call it a city. And they, they, what was interesting about this store was in the summertime, the fishing fleet came in. 
So, and the tourists came in and from like November to March, it poured like it, it never, you didn't see the sun. Like, and I wish I was exaggerating. Right. And then normally it rained the rest of the year too, but the three years I was there, it was, was gorgeous. So you had a huge influx of tourism and you had this massive fishing fleet that would buy five, 10 carts of groceries at a time. And what would happen, so if I got there July 1st, so I just like sat there and watched in awe as whatever was happening was happening. It had 35 uh, employees and they all worked like 48 hours a week from April till September. And in September, they were burnt out, pissed off, exhausted. But that was the life Everybody had done this for 10 years, right? Or 20 years. The whole, there, it had always been like, this was just the way it was. You worked for us. You didn't have any days. You had, you know, your two days off. You worked, worked, worked. You had no, uh, they would, you could accumulate days off and have extra days off. You didn't get any of those. And so then you spent the rest of the miserable time of the year getting this extra time off because you would, there was probably a three, you know, from, Sales in January to sales in August is probably was three times difference. Like it was just amazing, right? And I said, I'm not doing this again. This is terrible, right? So the next spring, I hired uh, 25 people, basically doubled the staff, and they were horrified, right? Like, oh my, you know, what are we going to do with all these people? And of course, the culture changed because these people didn't know the old culture. And at the end of the summer, everybody was happy because during the summer, we'd had so much staff that they could actually take their days off. They didn't have to work overtime and then they just couldn't, they just couldn't believe it. Right. And I thought, why were they so concerned? And it was part time, like you were hiring school kids and college kids and university uh, youngsters, and they would just all leave at the, you know, at the end of the at the end of the summer and they come back the following summer right because like, they knew what to do right we had this job for them we had work everyone had fun and uh, it was a small store too so you we were constantly bumping into everybody but it just struck me as like i know it's probably different now in terms of maybe there's not people but i could never understand why they would deliberately i mean it wasn't like it was a, a secret there wasn't enough staff there wasn't enough staff. And so I didn't know, I don't really understand why people are understaffed when they don't need to be. Now, maybe it's different if you have an, an NGO or a nonprofit where you have a budget and you can't, but then my mind goes, well, why not get interns or volunteers? So I'm kind of curious as to your insights on understaffing. Yeah. So actually I spend less time talking about the reasons why people are understaffed and more about once you're understaffed, what do you do? Okay. In full, in full disclosure. But at the same time, if I had to offer, and I did not do a lot of research to determine why it is uh, that people would go into situations understaffed, but I think we know some of it. You did talk about nonprofits. One of my books is specifically for nonprofits. If you go to my website, I'll just mention it quickly. It's impactfulcoaching.com forward slash epic. So there are two versions of the ebook at, at, at present. Hopefully I'll add a third soon. Uh, one of them is for nonprofit leaders and one of them is for small business owners and leaders. And so I think that that group in particular deals with understaffing regularly in part because if you're building a business, um, it's difficult to bring too many people on. There are a lot of added costs besides for salary for many people. And especially in the nonprofit space, there isn't necessarily a clearly defined value add where I could justify adding salary, especially when budgets are tight. So a lot of people who are running museums and libraries and schools and other nonprofits, they're struggling with how do I get the most out of the people I already have and have already been budgeted and already incorporated into the organization. If I'm starting a small business, often I'm in a similar situation. I don't yet have um, all of the uh, revenue generation that I need to bring on as many people as I would like. And sometimes, Scott, it's not necessarily a matter of <clears throat> the number of people, but it's the kinds of skills that you need. As you know, that as technology 
continues to advance and as the industry continues to change, there are new skills needed all the time. So in the past, I may have had somebody in this area or in that area. Now I need people to wear multiple hats uh, to fill in in my marketing and in my branding and in my social media presence and these kinds of things, certain areas on the, on the platform side of the business, the website development, et cetera, et cetera. So now the question is, if I am understaffed or if you're in a corporate situation where, where they're doing massive um, layoffs or rollbacks and, and people are just being asked to do more with less, I think you find it in, in all areas of, uh, of business today. Uh, or nonprofits, like I said. So p the question then becomes, what do I do as a leader to still make sure that I am delivering and perhaps ideally even over delivering, um, despite, like I said, having fewer people to rely on to get that work done and avoiding the burnout that you described before. So EPIC very quickly stands for four key pieces, which of course are, are unpacked in much more detail in the ebook. E stands for expectations or establishing clear expectations that involves goal setting, that involves job descriptions, that involves really understanding who's going to be responsible for what, putting people in the right place in order to succeed. Uh, the, the, the P stands for pulling together, right? You know, breaking down silos, avoiding territorialism, getting people working together, communicating with one another. Often it's not a matter of working harder, but it's a matter of working smarter. And part of working smarter is knowing what everybody is doing. What is my specific responsibility? How can I support somebody else? It may not be my direct responsibility, but maybe I know something that that person is going to benefit from. The I focuses specifically on the leader. Identify my strengths and weaknesses using 360s or other assessments to get that feedback. And then finally, the C is communicate, which of course overlaps to everything that we've been discussing. Right. Strengthening my communication, making sure that people get what they need, when they need it, and in the way that they need it, so that the information is flowing and really we can get focused mainly on the work that we need to do rather than guessing on what that might look like. That's fascinating. So what in your experience, what are some of the skills that leaders need that they don't have or they they underutilize or they're not aware of they should be focusing more on? A lot of it falls, without getting overly specific, Scott, I would say the soft skills um, are becoming more and more, they're rising to the top, I find, in the work that I do. People want to know, how do I delegate better? Uh, how do I manage change within my organization in terms of creating a platform for that change, identifying where we've been, where we need to go? But a lot of it is coming down to communication, uh, to becoming better listeners, mm. uh, to understanding how to build relationships both in work, at work, and out of work. All of these things are, are critical. And so last week I was presenting for hundreds of assistant principals in Orlando on the topic, and the week before I was in a medical practice down in Maryland speaking about the same thing. And this, again, is coming to the fore because I think that people are, to a large degree, they understand, uh, let's call it the the content or the um, the hard skills, you know, the things that they need to be doing, whether it's because they've come up through the organization and they know the work that needs to be done, they've gone to school, and in most cases our schools are doing a relatively decent job of giving people the technical skills that they need. But not enough time and attention is being focused on what we might call the universal interactive types of skills, especially for our younger workers who are so uh, engrossed in social media, so focused on connecting with people virtually, that we often forget what real relationships look like and how to build them and how to be physically present and how do I position myself in a room and how do I allow my nonverbals to speak for me in some cases and what are the downfalls of my nonverbals that I have to be mindful of and what are the pitfalls of electronic communication, especially something like email where so much of it is lost because of the nonverbal, you know, absence. These kinds of things I think a lot of folks are missing. And so they don't really know how do I position myself and my team for optimization uh, and, 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 and drive performance that way. And as you were talking, one of the things that, it, that I was thinking about was trust, like trusting the people in your group if you're the leader to do the job. And one of the things that I did for a few years was, uh, um, I, I don't know actually what you call it, but 
Dove makes commercials, and they make the commercials in London, England, with a British voice actress. And when they take the commercial to the United States, or to South Africa, or Australia, or Canada, they can't have a British voice actress. They need, and also because of laws and legalities and lawyers, they sometimes can't use the same words. So brilliant gets used in England and everyone would be like, what? In Canada or the United States. So they change it a little bit and they also need to get, a, in my case, a Canadian voice actress. And they liked the one that was in Vancouver. And I ended up being the person that was in charge, never having done it before, right? So, and not understanding at all what I, it wasn't, it was a copywriting position, but it wasn't copywriting. So I, I was just like, wow, what do you do? And the very first time the, you know, the engineers there, the voice actress is there. And I go, well, I've never done this before. And they, they both went, oh, okay. And turned around and went to work. And over three years, I became very good at it, obviously. And, uh, cause you'd get, just get good from practicing. But because I had not grown up in that industry, I didn't know that you weren't supposed to do certain things. One of them was ask the voice actress how she thought it went. And my voice actress loved that because we would do something and I'd say, well, what did you think? And I didn't know that nobody said that. Okay. And so she would, she got it to where she thought it was great, which was usually way better than me. And she had a better ear than I did, obviously. And the engineer was the same. I'd say, what do you think? And after a while, he would say, I uh, needs a little bit more of this. Not much, because he was really quiet. He's an engineering type. And I didn't realize it until they asked me to do the same thing in Toronto. So I was in Vancouver. And I said, well, I, you know, it's 5,000 miles away. They said, no, I'll just do it over the phone. So the first thing I said when we ran through it a couple times was, to the voice actress was, well, what do you think? Not knowing, based on her response, like emotional response, that no one had ever, ever asked her that question. She was just totally flabbergasted, right? And then she got kind of used to me, and she realized I really was sincerely wanting to know. And I said, well, you're a voice actress. You know if it's good or not. I, I have my ideas, but... And then that's when I realized like, oh, nobody asks the person doing the job if it was a good job. And she does this day in, day out. And it just really sort of shocked me, actually. Yeah, that's fascinating. I would say that sometimes from a leadership angle, you almost want to be, which is consistent with what I do as a coach, you want to be asking permission, especially where you're not sure. So for example, if you think that there's a cultural sensitivity, one of the things that I talk about when I do that soft skills and the active listening piece is that postures vary by culture. So in the United States or Canada, you might want to use, for example, an open posture leaning forward a little bit. In some other cultures, that may be viewed as being too pushy or in your face or not respective of somebody's space. So understanding the environment is really critical, whether you're moving from company to company, school to school, agency to agency, whatever it might be. Certainly, if you're traveling from one part of the country or one part of the world to another, one of the things you want to find out is stylistically, what are the, what are the yeses and nos? But then you could at the same time determine where you want to push the envelope a little bit. So in your case, once you know, for example, that it's not the industry norm for those questions to be asked, then maybe say, I know that in most cases, I'm not here to give you advice, but just as an idea that I would be thinking about, right. I would be saying, I know that it's not common for you to be asked your opinion, but I'll be honest with you. I think it's going to be much better for everybody if we're part of this together and you sharing your own insights about what, what's working, what isn't. Would you mind if I asked you when you're done how you thought it went? And if that framework is there, I think she knows where it's coming from. She doesn't feel like it's there's any you know malintent or anything like this. She will not only give you an honest response on the back end, but it may actually enhance her performance all the way through because she's thinking about it differently as she's delivering. Yes, yeah. When, there, when there's accountability, we know we perform better. That's just human nature. That's right. And as you were talking, you know, you reminded me of a, a situation that 
at the time, everybody that was watching it was laughing because it was some sort of get together, and there was someone from South America, and there was someone from I think he was German, and the South Americans, generally speaking, are close, like they'll get right close to you, and of course the the German, he he had a wider personal space, so this they the basically they were talking and they were moving across the room because the the uh, South American would step into the space and the German would step back and we were just watching this sort of dance going across. Neither of them, uh, you know, pain, you know, they were totally unconscious about what was going on. I'm sure they didn't even realize that they had moved 20 feet in the conversation, but it was really pretty funny. Right. On the other hand, you know, you, you, ha you may have them thinking afterwards, um, the, the South African, uh, South American perspective of why does he keep walking away from me, you know, am I offensive, am I this or that, yeah. the German fellow thinking that, you know, why is he invading my personal space all the time, doesn't he respect me, and doesn't he value who I am, and that's the kind of thing that could fester, even without folks knowing what the issue is, but we talk about having a feeling or a sense, mm -hmm. and a lot of the times that's driven simply by how the nonverbals are operating in the space around me. Yeah. So that's why I think for leaders to better understand their impact and the impact of folks one on the other is really, really important. And it could really vary a lot by culture, by location, by industry, by norms, all these kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. It's we need to be aware and we need to be trained in these in these areas in order to be way more way more effective, but also way more connected. Yeah, and part of that is training, but part of it is asking. You know, I think when leaders are humble enough and vul allow themselves to be vulnerable uh, vulnerable enough to ask people around them, you know, about their thoughts about, you know, a person's leadership style. What what am I doing that's working for you? What am I doing that's not working for you? And to to drill down a little bit in some key areas, especially if you've taken an assessment, whether it's a self-assessment or it's an assessment that, that allows for feedback from others, then to get more particular about how can I make this part of my work work better for my team. Those kinds of things often can be a real difference maker. Right. So as you were talking, I was wondering about, you know, like there's the A personality really, really driven, and I don't know what they call the other personalities that are not so driven or more laid back. How do you... Um, you know, if, if you're working with a client, how do you help them deal with those sorts of, of different types of interaction where like, oh, I'm just like, drag, 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 and the other guys are like, well, it's, it's just not doing it for me. Yeah, I think it's important for people to understand how they work best as well as how others around them may work best. So I use a little bit of a different model. I use something called True Colors, and I've delivered content around this quite a few times where... Um, people will take a self-assessment, they'll start to understand, am I a blue, a green, a gold, an orange? And each one represents a different type of personality style, whether you're more empathetic, you're more impulsive, you tend to really want to work more independently, more collaboratively, uh, you like to work out of the box, you Part of what we need to be doing uh, as leaders is to understand what is the impact of my leadership style, where can I pull to be most motivated, but even within that, you know, there are people who are going to, my, my style will resonate more with some and will, you know, rub others the wrong way, at the least if you let people know who you are, how you operate, give them a window into your world, minimally that's going to, you know, pull back the curtain a little bit, demystify the situation and how people interpret. So, for example, when I took over my position in school leadership where I was head of school, I succeeded somebody who was 16 years in the job, much more of an extrovert than I, much more of a people person, door wide open, constantly engaging, got his energy from those interactions, a 70-year-old with a 35-year-old personality in terms of being very effortless, very personable, very active. And I came in, and I'm much more contemplative I like to close the door so that I can think. Uh, I like to be, um, you know, I'm not necessarily as collaborative by nature, and it's something I have to work on in order to really incorporate other people's views, etc. 
So I think that when where I could have done a better job is in demystifying myself, clarifying for people that there, it's okay, but it's also a reality for people to have different leadership styles. And me closing the door does not mean that I don't want to speak with you. It just simply means that I want to be able to think and to concentrate without constant interruption. And therefore, because of that, we may need to interact at a different, in a different way, at a different time, more of a schedule type of thing, but the interaction will still happen and will still be very valued. It's just going to look a little bit different. And so I think what leaders need to be doing is taking a step back and saying, I'm not good or bad. I'm who I am. I'm hardwired in this particular way. And yes, you could be coached or conditioned a little bit here or there, but fundamentally, you're going to be who you are. And now it's a question of how do I communicate that? And how do I allow people to respect me for who I am? And at the same time, how do I use that to respect and support others who may operate very, very differently? And then as a result, I'll think about how am I going to communicate with certain people so that they can feel that I'm there to support them and at the same time that I'm really thinking about them in our processes. It does take work. There's no question about it. It's a lot easier in some ways if we don't be linear and cut from the same cloth and we could just roll out one solution for everybody. But in terms of depth of relationship and really understanding what the value add is in building our team, I think that's really the way to go. Yeah, awesome. That's great. Well, Naftali, we're coming to the end of, of our time together today. Hopefully we can do this again because this has been awesome. I've really enjoyed what you've shared. And it certainly made me think of different things in, in far different ways, which is one of the reasons why I like to do these podcasts. Uh, but before we go, could you tell us a little bit about... Um, well, a little bit about the two books again. Give us maybe a, a little uh, summary of them and some of the things that you do. And also, if someone wants to get a hold of you and, and talk to you more about these issues, how they can do that. Sure. Thank you, Scott. So you can find me. Uh, I'll tell you about – let me go in order of your questioning. Uh, in terms of the books, uh, one is called Becoming the New Boss, uh, The New Leader's Guide to Sustained Success. It's available on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com and a number of other online platforms, including my own dedicated website, becomingthenewboss.com. The book was intended primarily for people who are transitioning into or within leadership. And it was the book that I wish I had when I began my own leadership journey. So I wrote it very much from the perspective of somebody who's been there, done that. You now I tell the joke in the book that's probably well circulated about the executive who was interviewed by a newspaper reporter and says, sir, how did you achieve such astounding success? And he said, easy, two words, good decisions. And so the reporter persists, r reporter persists and he says, well, how do you come to good decisions? And he says, one word, experience. And then the, the reporter persists further and he says, well, how do you come to get all that experience? And the guy says, two words, bad decisions. <laughs> and, that, and that's really often the, the trajectory. So my goal in all of it was really to, to shorten the learning curve for people, give them the experience that they need, understand the things to look for, um, and really try to get those relationships embedded so that you could hit the ground running and enjoy sustained success. Uh, the other book that we talked about, the ebook, uh, The Epic Solution to Understaffing, two versions of it, was intended specifically to address an issue that I kept hearing time and again and talking with my clients and interviewing people in leadership that they just feel that they are overstretched. And how could they maximize uh, their leadership opportunity to get the most done for themselves and for their teams and their organizations? So I delve into those four pieces that we talked about before. Uh, connecting with me, the best way is through, um, through my website, impactfulcoaching.com. You can find a phone number there. You can find access to my email or just send me a form on the contact page. I get all of the emails directly. Uh, I read them. I respond to them. I'm more than happy to engage. And you can find me on social media as well. Facebook, Twitter at Impactful Coach, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm on all of those platforms and uh, certainly would love to be able to engage with your listeners further. Great. Well, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate uh, you sharing your knowledge with us today. And uh, for everyone else listening, we really appreciate you tuning in. This is Scott Patton, Dean of Blogonomics and Pedology for Internet Marketing Unleashed. And we'll see you next time, everybody. Bye-bye.